So let's open up with a, with a word of prayer first. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this beautiful springtime day. And Lord, that we are preparing, Lord, for Resurrection Sunday coming, for the death, the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior. And Lord, we just thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, I ask that you just bring to remembrance the things you once said this morning. Lord, I ask for an anointing and a quickening in our spirits. Lord, a guard over our mouths. And Lord, we just say we love you, we desire you, and we're praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right, this morning, as you can see, the title is The Already But Not Yet. And actually, I'm going to be probably teaching over this for the next several months. Uh, Some of you may be wondering, okay, what is the already but the not yet? And a lot of theologians will use that term to express the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God? It's very simple, really. It's the rule and the reign of God of God upon planet Earth. Now, it's not salvation, because sometimes we think of salvation, but salvation is the interest ramp to the kingdom of God. You know, it's not the church. The church is part of the kingdom of God, but it's not the kingdom. And it's not the United States of America. What the kingdom of God does, it affects every area of life. So not just the spiritual, uh, the economy, business, education, uh, the culture, everything is connected and should be uh, infiltrated by and commanded by the kingdom of God. It's the rule and reign. Now, I'm going to be going through the book of Matthew, and this is just going to be kind of an overview. In fact, I had told Becky earlier this week that don't try to put down all the verses because I I probably have like 25 different verses, but they're all in order just in Matthew, so it's going to be easy for you to follow. And then in succeeding weeks, I'll be coming back and kind of opening each, each one of those and kind of getting a lot more depth into what the kingdom of God is and the different uh, what the Lord says about it, because that was one of his main messages. He says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And even in the uh, Matthew 24, when we get to that place where he says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the nations. Not just the gospel of salvation, but it's the, it's the, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And in Matthew, it's a little different because... But, more than often than not, he uses the kingdom of heaven, while the other gospels use the kingdom of God. It's the same thing, same meaning. And so we're going to be going through those. Again, it's the primary mission and primary message of Jesus. And I've often heard it said, you know, well, what's the already but not yet? Well, the already is the kingdom of God is here, okay? It was instituted with the death, the resurrection, the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So it began then. But we won't see the culmination of it until Jesus returns. So we're in this place, kind of in between, where the kingdom of God is growing, it's expanding, but it's not yet to its fullness. I've often heard an example being like, an analogy being like in World War II, Uh, the invasion of Normandy, D-Day. When that happened, when that was successful and the beachhead was established, that pretty much said that we, the war was won. And yet, more casualties happened after Normandy than before. So we're kind of in that place where we're instituting, we're, we're seeing the kingdom of God begin to spread, grow throughout the world. So it's, it's here today, but it's not complete. 
All right, so let's go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew. We're going to start Matthew chapter 3. And again, it's just going to be easy to follow, so just get your Bibles or your mobile device, and we're just going to start with chapter 3. I just want to show you how, how the importance of that subject of the kingdom of God is just throughout the book of Matthew. And how the emphasizes, and a lot of times we just don't think about it that much. So in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, we'll start with John the Baptist. And it says, In these days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So John the Baptist was born under the Old Covenant. And actually, he died in the Old Covenant because Herod, Herod had him killed. But he said, the kingdom of God is near. He was preaching something, and people were coming out from Jerusalem and all of Judea, coming out to hear a simple message, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Something's coming. Something's changing. Now, chapter 4, verse 17 we're going to find Jesus. He's just come back from uh, the temptation. He's been out in the wilderness for 40 days. And he comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 17, he says, From this time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Another, he was announcing something's coming, something's being inaugurated here. The kingdom of God is near. And in verse 23, that same chapter, it says, Jesus went through out Galilee, teaching in the synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Now, that's one thing you're going to see as we go through these, that how often the kingdom of God is associated with healing and also deliverance, but healing of every sickness and every disease. Because as we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is there any sickness in heaven? No. No disease? Is there any sin? No. So that's where we're going. And so we, that's why we're to, to preach or pray that. In chapter 6, verse 10 is that very verse. It's the Lord's Prayer. We're all familiar with it. In verse 9, it says, as the disciples ask him, you know, how do we pray? And he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So for his kingdom to come, for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now in that same chapter, verse 33, is actually uh, what I could kind of consider my life verse, if I was going to pick one out. And it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So first of all, the first thing, our first priority is seeking the kingdom of God, which is totally different, a total upside-down kingdom as compared to the kingdom of the world. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So that should be the goal of each of our lives, seeking first his kingdom. Now, chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, is kind of a warning. Because it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons 
and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So it's not somebody who just talks the talk, but somebody who actually lives it out in their lives. And then there has that intimacy. I never knew you. In other words, never had an intimacy, an intimate relation with that person. It's like that, that saying, you know, God has no grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. So each one of us has to come to that place ourselves of receiving the Lord in our life and giving our life to the Lord. Okay, let's turn over to chapter 9, verse 35. And it says, Jesus went throughout all the towns and the villages, teaching in the synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. So again, we see that connection with healing every disease and sickness. In God's kingdom, there is no sickness or disease. And it is good news. It is a gospel. It's good news. It's the good news of a new kingdom that is coming and is here now. All right, in chapter 10, verse 7 and 8, let's turn over the next page. And this is when he's going to be sending out his 12 disciples. So this is the first time they're going out by themselves on a mission. And he tells them, as you go, preach the message of the kingdom of heaven, that the kingdom, the message of the of the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So the MO of the kingdom of God is heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. So again, that's, that's the kingdom of God going forth against the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of this world because the God of this world is Satan and replacing it. Okay, t- turn to chapter 11. Matthew 11, 11. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth... Among those born of woman, of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. So the kingdom of God, even John the Baptist, who was considered one of the greatest men under the old covenant, it says in comparison to the new covenant, in comparison to the kingdom of God, he is least. Because we have been born into a new kingdom, a new covenant. And it also says violent men take it by force. Now, it's not talking about a physical violence. It's talking about a spiritual violence. People who are spiritually violent going after the kingdom of God. We need to sometimes just stir ourselves up, remind ourselves that it is violent men, violent men and women who are pressing into the kingdom to take the kingdom, to be part of that kingdom, to expand the kingdom across the nations and the nations of the world. Okay, chapter 12, and verse 28. This is where Jesus uh, had been casting out demons, and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were convict, or actually accusing him of casting out demons by the prince of the demons. But he answers and says, but if I drive out demons 
by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So another manifestation of the kingdom of God is demons being cast out. People who are demonized to whatever degree being set free. For Jesus came to set the captives free. Verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 11. He's talking to disciples because Jesus has begun to talk to the crowds in parables. And so they're asking him, you know, what is, what, why do you speak in parables? You know, why don't you just speak it clearly? And he says, he replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. So this knowledge of the kingdom that we're all supposed to learn, that we're all supposed to grow in and understand. In verse 19 of that same chapter, it says, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. So it's the message of the kingdom the enemy tries to stop and keeps people from understanding the message of the kingdom of God. And if you go on down to the parable of the weeds, it's the same thing. Jesus told him another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like. And I'm not going to go through all that right now, but we'll go through some of these parables later of what the message was that the Lord was trying to, to teach his disciples. And again, again, down in verse 31, the same chapter, he tells them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and he planted in his field. Now, though it is the smallest of all siege, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. So he's showing that kingdom of God starts very small. You know, it started with Jesus and 12 disciples. And then it began to grow. And then it began to the 120 in the upper room, and he sends out the 70. And, and even though the kingdom of God starts so small, it will eventually encompass the whole earth. And so that's what we're waiting for, the culmination of the, of the kingdom of God upon planet earth. But it starts small, but it grows. And in verse 33... He tells them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked through the dough. So again, that picture of something small, growing, and encompassing the whole earth. Verse 40 talks about as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will be the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Another parable after that is the parable of the hidden treasure, pearls. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Now, when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had to buy that field. So that, again, that emphasis on the value of the kingdom of God. There's nothing more valuable than attaining that. In verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away 
and sold everything that he had and bought it. Verse 47, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake. It caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets, but they threw away the bad fish. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, let's skip over to chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. And Jesus says, at this time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I will tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it's an upside down kingdom. Whoever humbles himself, opposite what the world does, which you put, put yourself forward, is that humility that God values. And in chapter 20, verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven, of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men and work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and went into his vineyard. We're not going to go through the whole parable, but we will at a later time in the meaning of that. So he has all these different parables that talks about the kingdom of God. And in chapter 21, in verses 43 through 46, we have another one. He says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom, the fall, on whom it falls will be crushed. Now, when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. And they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid because of the crowd of the people and held him as a prophet. So he gives this, this parable saying that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you between the religious leaders of the time over the nation of Israel says, this kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to another people. So we also have warnings, but we, have, but we also have a lot of encouragement of how the kingdom of God grows and how it proceeds. Also in, in chapter 21, there's a parable of the tenants. We won't go through that, except it, it again showing how to be faithful and those who produce fruit, and the reward as a result of that. 22, chapter 22, verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in a parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And then it goes on to tell about people who are invited, those who didn't take the time, but we'll go through that at another time. And in chapter 20, or 23, verse 13, it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrite! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces, and you yourself do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. So again, we have another warning about keeping others from coming into the kingdom of God, which are the Pharisees and the scribes were attempting to do. In verse 24, chapter 24, which is the 
end times chapter of uh, the book of Matthew in verse 14. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So it's not just the message of salvation, it's the gospel of the kingdom. It will be preached in the whole world, every nation, every tongue will have an opportunity before the end comes. In chapter 25, in verse 1, again, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. In other words, that's another whole par- parable about being prepared, being ready for the coming of the king. We'll go through that at another time. In 25, verse 14, he gives another one, the parable of the talent. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. In other words, we are rewarded on our faithfulness of what we've done to expand the kingdom of God for it to grow. So that's just through Matthew, just showing you how prevalent that message of the kingdom of God is, that it is one of the main subjects of Jesus, expanding and growing the kingdom of God. Now, I just got two other verses, Acts chapter 1, just to show you that this whole thing just continues. So in Acts chapter 1... And verse 3, so this is after he's, he's the death and resurrection. And it says, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So after his death, resurrection, there's a 40-day period before he ascends to heaven, and he spends his time teaching the disciples about the kingdom of God. And like I say, this is a, it's the already, but not yet. So one last verse, Revelations 11, verse 15, which is one of my favorite It says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there was a loud voice in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and forever. So that's where we're going. That's the, not yet, but that's coming. The where the kingdom of God is fully established on planet earth, where all sickness, where all sin is done away with. But in that process, there's a progression as we begin to take more and more territory, as we begin to influence, as we're like that mustard seed that started small or that yeast that was put in that lump until the whole lump is made holy. And so the kingdom of God is a critically important subject. And, the Lord, and Jesus has so much to say about the kingdom of God. And so we're going to be going over that in the next few, like say, next few months probably I'll be kind of going over that because it's, it's mainly a New Testament thing except for the book of Daniel, which gives us the timing when the kingdom will appear. And we'll kind of go over that, how Daniel prophesied that it would be during the time of the Roman Empire when the kingdom is is initiated. And then we'll be going through some of these parables and just what Jesus taught about the kingdom of God and how important it is. So begin to focus, and remember, it's not just salvation. It's about the kingdom of God. And that influences every area. It's not just the church, but it's business, it's agriculture, it's, it's education, 
It's the culture. It's everything that God wants to infiltrate that and have his rule and reign over those areas of life. And not just as we think about it, you know, uh, religiously or spiritually, but his kingdom. And when his kingdom comes, there's peace, there's glory, there's, it's going to be it's beyond our comprehension. And of course, we will be changed because right now we're all failed vessels. We're vessels that, that blow it. There's sin. There's still sin within us. There's sometimes we have to fall down and take two steps back and then we go forward again. But we're on a, we're on a projected path to the kingdom, to glory. So anyway, look forward to that in the next few months. We'll begin to kind of develop that a lot more. I just wanted to kind of give you an overview this morning of what I'm going to be talking about. And then I want to talk to you about something else. Again, Wednesday night, we're going to be talking about, again, this, it's our meeting where we have prayer, intercession, and we take time to pray for people for healing. And what I want to do this Wednesday night, something, uh, a word that has come forth. Some of you may have heard a little bit about this. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, if you know who Chris Reed is, raise your hand. Chris Reed, R-E-E-D, okay. He is a uh, prophetic, actually he's taking over for uh, Rick Joyner at Morningstar Ministry. He has a, he's a young guy, that's what he is, probably, th- I'm guessing, late 30s, but uh, very accurate in his, I've seen him minister to people, and very, very accurate. Well, uh, on May, or March, March 25th, he had a dream, and I'd kind of like to talk, because I feel like I'm coming back again to the same subject, which every, seems like maybe, Six months, something happens that, that tells me that we better get prepared. That our lives are not going to be what we call normal. Uh, he had a dream, and I'm going to read some of that. Uh, and it reminds me so much of some others that I have, uh, over the years, seen some of the same thing. Like John Paul Jackson, some of you may remember that name. He was a prophetic voice. He was here in Kansas City for a while. Of course, Bob Jones, and there's another man by the name of Terry Bennett, who all had very similar uh, words or you know dreams or visions that came. And I think we kind of need to pay attention. So I've made like, I had uh, Becky make like 15 copies, so there'd be some copies available for you to like take any of them, kind of look over it. I've also seen, there's been a couple different interviews he's done. Uh, one was with Elijah List. A better one was with, uh, uh, all of a sudden I'm going to, with Cindy Jacobs and uh, the prophetic fellow from Texas. All of a sudden, uh, it'll come to me in a little bit. But anyway, and it was very good. I, in fact, I'd maybe encourage us to, to look at that interview just to get more of a more in depth, but he saw se- several headlines, and so I'm going to kind of l- read a little bit of this, and it just says that uh, start the first here. He says he saw a man in this dream. It was again on May on March 25th, and he said I saw an unknown man dressed in black in a black suit holding a $50 bill. Now, he tore the $50 bill in three stages. Now, in the first stage of the dream, he stood in front of me, he took the $50 bill, and he tore off a third. And he did random, as he did, random people started to bring me national newspapers one after another. And all I could read were the headlines. The first headline read, the dollar drops 30% in value, Mideast oil strikes deal with China instead of the U.S. And then each of these have Rick Joyner, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, has comments about it. I'm not going to read that right now. I'm just going to give you the headlines. 
Another headline read, The Perfect Storm, Inflation Reaches New, time, new High. We're already kind of seeing that in a way, but this is going much farther. It says, I was handed another headline which read, Food Shortage, food shortage Crisis as Wheat and Bread Imports are Stalemate. Another headline was handed to me which read, Riots and Civil Unrest as Citizens Demand Entitlement Checks. Yeah. In the second stage of the dream, I again saw the man dressed in black holding the rest of the $50 bill, and this time he tore it in half. As he did, I felt an earthquake under my feet. A person walked up and handed me a headline which read, Israel and Palestine, the Palestinian two-state solution reached. Now, I don't know how many remember Bob Jones, but he had had a word back then that once that would happen, the new Madrid earthquake would go off and would separate the United States, basically in two. And I've been in actually meeting with SEMA, the, the uh, state uh, emergency management, and they've made plans already. There's only one highway that would go from, from uh, the east part of the state to the west part that wouldn't have the, because the bridges would be gone all across from the Mississippi on. So something to be considering. So watch for that. If you begin to hear about a peace being signed and two-state solution and all that, be aware. Another one was in the third stage of the dream, the man in black took the rest of the $50 bill, and he started tearing it into small pieces, one by one. A person walked up and handed me another headline which read, America in Pieces. More states succeed from the nation in rebellion to the federal government. I was then handed another headline which read, U.S. military takes charge as uncertainly looms over the federal government. which I would soon to me martial law. And I remember something many years ago that Rick Joyner said, because he said that would happen, but he said it's very important that we pray for the marshal, or in other words, who's in charge, who this person is at the very top, so important who they are. That if there's someone who wants to, to reestablish the Constitution, to follow the Constitution, it makes a, a big difference. Another one was, in the fourth and final stage of the dream, the man in black took out what he looked like a new $1 bill, but it also looked like a cell phone. I saw George Washington's face on it, but it looked different. As I looked, someone had me another newspaper, and the headline read, New Currency for a Renewed Nation. So obviously a, a new currency, a reset. And then he says, the key for our country at that time will be leadership. A crisis unlike any we have faced before will, will require a George Washington or Abraham Lincoln-like figure combined with a Moses or Apostle Paul-like figure. The Lord has promised us he will send a new generation of founding five, five fathers who will fight with the same courage and resolve to restore our republic as the first one did. Our government restoration to its constitutional foundation is critical, which would also restore the strongest economy to the world has ever known. However, this, for this to happen, we will be required to have a spiritual renewal. And he goes on and says, we are now entering the most troubled time in our history. There is also a coming restoration that will build our country to its foundation of our loving and honoring God and his ways. Then his favor will be restored to us. The restoration cannot happen without that. 
He will raise up brilliant, godly leaders for us as we had in the beginning. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Now, the last headline handed to me read, Simplicity Restored as America Grows Their Own Food Again. And then he goes on, uh, we're talking about how back in World War II we had victory gardens. You know, everybody had turned their backyards into gardens so that the farms could actually support uh, the soldiers and what was going on in the war, and everyone was raising their own food. And he says, I believe this is a prophetic dream is a warning. It is one of the most vivid, intense dreams I've ever had. There are so many events in the world right now that could cause a perfect storm. I believe this dream is an unfolding of events in the near future for which we may must all prepare. In fact, I believe the word preparation will take on a whole new meaning in the days ahead. After consulting with our leadership team, we came to some partial conclusion about the dream's meaning. For we all know in part, and we prophesy in part, 1 Corinthians. No one has the whole picture, but we all have a part. When we put these parts together, we will have a better perspective. So that was kind of the dream. And then, like I said, I listened to a couple different uh, interviews where he was interviewed on different bank, uh, by different people. And I think it's, uh, it's something we need to take seriously, to be praying about. Uh, you know, and personally, I have always felt that revival takes place in the context of troubling times. Because a lot of people aren't going to give you the time of day. But as pressure comes, then expect things to change. So it's not to present, you know, or, or, or to give you any fear at all, but I think you also need to be praying, ask, okay, what's my part? What do I need to do? What in my life do I need to change? How do I need to prepare? How do I need to be light in the time of darkness? You know, Isaiah 60 says that when great darkness covers the earth, arise and shine, your light's going to be brighter. But at the same time, I want you to be prepared that things aren't always going to be as they are now and what that looks like. Be prepared for shortages, for shakings. You know, we, we saw some riots and things in the past, you know, year after the George Floyd thing and all that, but I don't think that's anything in comparison to what may be heading our way. So I just want to use it kind of as a wake-up because I, I keep getting these every, like I say, six months, something will happen, will spur me on to realize that we, you know, you, you can't set this on the back, you know, it's, well, it's way in the future, this stuff that he's talking about, he believes is within is coming now in the next couple of years, not something way in the future. But the Lord has answers. The Lord always has the people. He always has a remnant, and He will accomplish what He wants to do. And if it takes that, when we say, "Lord, let Your will be done," Your kingdom come, Your will be done, whatever that looks like, it may be a lot different. But God can give you guys. Wisdom. Okay, how do I respond? What do I do differently? In every area of our life. So anyway, Wednesday night, I want to kind of, those who are interested, like to come and we kind of discuss it, look at it in more depth, pray about it, ask God for wisdom and direction. Again, I think we all have a normal bias. We all have a bias that says, well, life is going to be tomorrow like it is today. But that's not always true. At times, something changes, but it's an opportunity for the gospel. It's an opportunity for the kingdom of God. So it's not, you know, I have to tell you the negative because unless you're prepared for that, you might be shaken. But if you're prepared for it, it's a time for opportunity to go forward.